So yeah, I'm Peter, um, one of the co-founders of Mapillary and uh, some other interesting things in Malmö, but, but that's, that's what I'm going to speak about. Um, yeah, what is Mapillary? We, we have the, the kind of bold idea uh, to, to partly build a, uh, a visual representation of the whole physical Earth. Um, uh, a bit like what you would expect from Google Street View, but the actual data, not just not just images. And we, and in order to do that for anything that matters, we can send around vans and we can send you know hardware around. The the thing is, the hardware, since maybe a year or two back, is good enough in your phone that you can actually do quite a good job of, of uh, you know, cleaning that data up and actually getting some, some interesting data out of that and, and uh, put these tools in, in, in everyone's hand. So, so what, what I normally say is that, that Mapillary is not your, your, your normal you know, dead pixel site. You load things up to YouTube or to Flickr, then these pixels sit there and you create kind of a social network around it. What we do is actually to create a contributing model of the world with every single image that goes in. So you actually make new friends by interacting with them via your content, which is kind of unique. But also that gives quite interesting um, uh, effects on, on what comes out of that. So it's not, so what, what happens is that we started this uh, after a few prototypes uh, beginning of last year. Uh, 2014, uh, basically for the open. The company was was a few months older. Um, right now, there's 39 million photos in there, uh, contributed all by not us, by but by users. So you so you take your your phone app, Android or iPhone, or your GoPro or action camera with the GPS. You you make your pictures, you upload them. Uh, you keep the the uh, uh, authorship of these pictures and give us a. a right to do what we want with that picture. So basically, you put them into public domain. And uh, we, um, uh, we process them, we blur them, we, we license plate blur them, and we extract you know, the, the visual features out of them. And, uh, and we build a database out of that. Um, so, so you know, individual contributors have, like this is Vorgorda, uh, one of the first examples. That's the beginning of last year. One guy biked around here, his, his little hometown in like, a weekend and, and map this. Uh, this is Malmö a bit more. This is uh, there, there's there's about 50 contributors here. I would say uh, more now. Um, Hanau in Germany, Dresden. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy people doing doing this. Uh, they have their own reasons. I mean, this is a collaborative effort, and uh, um, and th th there's very very different reasons for doing mapping. I mean, there's very different reasons to do OpenStreetMap and other and, and Wikipedia and so on. But the main reason is to, to make that data available. Uh, it's a bit like um, we are on a mission to make the, the, the public space publicly available, even digitally. Right? So, so that's, that's one of our missions too. There is no public archive where you can actually use uh, uh, good information. There's a lot of companies driving around in cars and ripping off the public space. To make to make private cars, you know, go around and self-drive and so, but they only cover what they need. They don't publish it. It's not usable, and it it's not available in the U.S. or uh, in, in in Africa or in a slum in Bangladesh. No one cares. Google cares about the ten biggest cities in Sweden, maybe. So, so you go around, you take the pictures, and. Uh, you know, you could, uh, for instance, see, so we are starting to import data for cities. So there's so much data l laying around. Uh, but um, I can show you something, how that, how that could look like. Uh, for instance, this is from uh, outside Malmö here. Um, one contributor has been walking here. Uh, you can see this here. You see, he walked in a kind of zigzaggy pattern here. Let's see how, how good the connection is here. You see this? And from that, let me make it a bit bigger, like this. Uh, and from that you can, you can then, what we do is to extract the features from these 2D phone photos. This is a normal mobile phone. He went like this. You see the zigzag patterns, right? The data we extract from that, the model that is behind that is actually derived from, from research at LTH uh, in, in, in Jan Eriks, who's one of my co-founders, uh, 
a department of computer vision. We have a lot of big data science behind that. I'm one of the founders of that company, uh, Neo4j. So, so, so we use a lot of like NoSQL databases and, and you know, data analytics. But what comes out is, for instance, a point cloud. Um, so we are building a global, basically global point cloud. You can see here how this looks, right? So from these sequences, which are, which are these, you're projecting and extracting overlapping pixels, basically, and you build a model of the world. Eventually, this point cloud with every picture taken gets denser and denser and denser, and it's eventually good enough to measure, to detect objects, to navigate around, and so on, so on, so on. So you can actually, you know, go around in this point cloud and even, you know, switch and go that way and so on. So if I reload this, you see the actual textures. So what you see in Mapillary is really a big database of textures, right? So then we blend the textures according to that point cloud. We know the layout of that. Uh, another example might be, you might like this one. We actually did that. That's based on that whole, uh, he was one of the taller rows, right? Yes. Uh, no, that was uh, about face detection. Yeah. Uh, so the face detection thing is now used, well, similar technology to detect faces, but to blur them. So not to recognize them, but to de-recognize them. Yeah. So we do that for, for uh, license plates and we do that for other stuff. So if you, if you look here, there we had a little gathering, uh, a, a map mob, where we had a couple of people doing a human rig, right? Going that way and going that way with mobile phones. You can actually see some of them here. If you go there, see that? So if we, if we look at what comes out, these are only 2D images and GPS. We are not doing LiDAR scanning or any like high precision method. So, so what you do here is you can actually see the whole area kind of like, uh, let me see if I can find that. <sighs> ah. This is a very, very, uh, here we go. You can see the whole area. See that? Here are the stones and there's, you know, the grass and so on. So, so we actually reconstruct the world as it is, not as models are. Um, and for this, of course, you need, you need, massive amounts of, of information, and we, we can do that. Uh, everybody's helping. So, so the question is, how, how, how do you build you know, such a business? Uh, we, only, we started with four people, we are now 10. Um, so, so based on, on the other projects that, that, that I helped start, um, I think there's, there's three interesting facts or, or pillars that you need to drive a successful business that's not going to grow through the roof and uh, scale linearly in costs. We need a big sales team and so on and so on. So what you, what you first need to engage people, uh, you know, commercial or not commercial, is a vision. People need to sign up on a vision and often people are not following projects or products. They're actually following people that drive these products. I mean, people are buying... You know, Apple not not because just of the product, but because Steve Jobs worked there, and you know, you want this dedicating attention to design. You sell an image, a vision of of what this makes you too, because you join a tribe, right? So, so, I mean, it's, it's especially interesting that uh, is that is with with products that have virtually no difference, like cars. Everything that you see is just image, it's just tribe, it's just lifestyle, whatnot. There's no technical, if you see advertising, there's not even a technical word in it. And you're supposed to pay, you know, a few hundred thousand crowners more just because of this image. Um, so the other, the other pillar is community. I mean, you want, you want to have evangelists, you want to have followers, you want to have customers. That are that are your fans, not not, not your, your your enemies, right? And then, of course, you want to make some business. Everybody understands nowadays that that you can't really have a project that is only uh, geared toward providing stuff uh, because people expect quality of service and people expect someone to you know reboot the service middle in the middle of the night if, if something goes down. So it's just that you need to uh, to make sure you. 
you have a viable you know, service to sell. So, so for the vision, uh, normally something of greater purpose is, goes, a, goes a long way. Uh, for instance, when we started like Code Dojo here in, in, in Malmö, um, uh, you, you, you say, you know, we want to make the world a better place for our kids by enabling them to have computer literacy, and that's not achievable by just teaching them Word. So, so uh, uh, and, and, and that is not achievable immediately. It's a process, and it's, it's hard, and it's long, and that also means people can contribute. People want con to contribute. They don't want to have, like, immediate success, because that's not a vision. That's just, you know, an operational achievement. Um, and, uh, and of course, you should make it fun. You should have your t-shirts, your gadgets, your whatever. People need to show off, right? And they, they, they want to have cred for, for, for things. Um, for us, it's, it's, it's the vision, of course, to, to visually map the world. And everybody can contribute. And everybody understands this is basically unachievable. But, uh, and when we started, everybody said, you know, this is just crazy, why, why are you doing this? And after the first million of, of images that took half a year, people started, you know, getting a bit interested, and then now we get 150,000 images per day. Um, so, so things are increasing, and it doesn't seem so unachievable anymore, right? Um, this is actually some of the guiding principles even in building a community with a database or with ever, ever any any product so, or, or any community. So, so what you want to do is you, you really want to encourage binding of the, of the community. You want to have meetups, you want to have, you know, like, like we have now, you want to give uh, uh, people a, a, a platform to rally to, to, to each other and to know each other. Uh, also, normally, you expect people to do something for you, and everybody knows that. It's just that you have to make sure that you give back more than you take out of a community. Otherwise, the community dies. So, and, and you don't have to take money or whatever, but you, you might take out, for instance, services. You might take out uh, people selling stuff for you or, or whatever. I mean, it, or, or people just, you know, driving around and taking pictures uh, for the project, which actually costs them a, 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 lot, of, a lot of gas. I mean... There's uh, there's a guy who drove around all of Iceland to to map mapillary. That's that's a few hundred dollars of of, of gas money, right? Um, you always have to be honest and transparent, especially with like open data, open source communities. They expect you to be very very honest. So if there's stuff broken or 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 stuff not working, that's that's okay. But if there's stuff hidden, hidden agendas or hidden you know code or whatever, that's not okay. Um, uh, also, um, the first contributors as an any tribe are, are your best evangelists. So, so you do anything for them. Treat your community as a customer. So the issues that a community files for your project are as important as your customer. So, so that's, uh, that, that, that's a good thing. And then don't departmentize community involvement. The best, the best companies are the ones who have like the whole the whole staff being, you know, a forerunner for a community. If you look, for instance, at GitHub or so, there's not a single employee in that company that would not use GitHub for private projects. Otherwise, you have nothing to do there. I mean, it should be an honor to, to serve that project or you get your kids into that T-shirt. Uh, I mean, make sure your, your staff actually commits to the idea and not just goes to work. To, to lift some salary. Um, also be aware of the community funnel. Uh, so so it's, it's a bit like, like Morton said, it's a funnel also. Uh, it goes a bit like a sales funnel. People are aware of your project, they become members, so they might sign up or lurk around. In open source projects, you have around 5% uh, active contributors that are actually ever uttering anything about your project a tweet or a mail or whatever. So it's like just 5% of the lurkers that are aware of your project that ever make a public contribution. Uh, and, and then these go into either real like core contributors that actually commit code or they fix documentation or whatever, 
or they become even customers because they're a fan of you and they see the value of what you're doing. Uh, and then you might even, you know, go any, uh, even farther and hire them. The thing is, uh, this funnel never goes back. So when you're here or when you are, say, here, uh, there's very few people that go in that direction. You, 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 you become deeply involved into a project and then you go back to just casually, you know, no, normally something else catches your attention. So if, if this can't hold you, you would just drop out of that funnel. Uh, and a way to fast track this is, for instance, to pay people money. As soon as you, as you pay them, for instance, that's, that's getting them from here to basically there in one step. And you miss out all the valuable contributions. They will never go back. They will never, ever do anything without money again. So, so money and valuable stuff, like too valuable stuff, that is not honor-based or karma-based, is just destroying your community. It will just, you know, it, it, it will make all your contributors basically employees. And you can't pay that. That's, that's the actual essence of, an, of a crowd. Like you cannot pay a crowd. Um, Business-wise, uh, these projects are normally, you know, they're, they're kind of hard to pull off because you need to ride that, that bubble of contributions. It's very, very slick. So you want to stay, you know, uh, I normally picture like open source and open data and these crowd initiatives as a big bubble. People are contributing to something that lifts the project up. And, and you want to balance what comes out and so in all directions, so everybody feels kind of recognized and, and, and good. As soon as you do anything wrong, you slip from that bubble into one direction. You, you became too commercial or you became too non-commercial, so no one treated you as a real partner, or you just you know, put in too little time or you didn't communicate and, and all these stuff. So you have to be very, very careful about staying up there and it will, it will kind of lift you. Uh, make the value plausible. Uh, there, is, there is value to be had, even in, in, in crowdsource project. Um, and, uh, and yeah, the crowd approach uh, into an asset is an interesting thing. You can be where others can't, right? So, so, so you can actually have services or have, you know, campaigns or so in slums in Soveto or in Lesotho. We just had, you know, uh, uh, the Red Cross mapping in, in Lesotho. Um, in one month, uh, around 50 contributors in Lesotho mapped Lesotho, and that resulted in more contributions to OpenStreetMap in that month than the whole of the USA. So they made over a million edits in, in OpenStreetMap based on mapillary pictures. Just 50 guys. I mean, th that's, that's quite insane. Th a, a, even a government would not be able to pull that off. There will be insane amounts of costs that you have to put in to, to get that kind of effect. Right? And also, uh, the crowd is acting as your, your lead generator. Your fans are sitting you know, in municipalities doing this stuff in, in their spare time. So for Mapillary, these, uh, these uh, services are different things. We detect right now uh, um, street signs. We're going into OCRing these, uh, these images, and these are like real assets for municipalities, for instance. They have no idea where their signs are, if they're right, if they still are there, um, um, and so on and so on. Uh, it, it, they can't even classify them. Right now, it's in the head of, of uh, a bunch of people that, that might go in, uh, into retirement soon. So we integrate into you know, professional GIS tools and so on, which are not that interesting for, 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 for the greater crowd. Also, I mean, the services also that we put every image that we have processed that is like anonymized and so out under the Creative Commons share like license, which means it can be used for Wikipedia, it can be used for other services, and you can basically create a street view uh, based on uh, uh, based on open data. So, so that's what I have. Just to to make sure, I just wanted to show you something that we did that came in today. Actually, look at this. So, the biggest uh, maybe it's that. I hope it is. No, it's not that one. Um, okay, but you probably can see it here too. 
So these are 360 images done with a little camera that cost about $300, a Ricoh Theta. Uh, it's about like a GoPro. And that's a guy sticking a selfie stick in his backpack, going around here. And from that, we can create you know, something that, that resembles or is better than, than Street View anywhere. So you can just you know, go here and follow him. And you can even you know, go here and go sideways and so on. So we are right now deploying this feature. And you can then you know, merge this with the normal images. So we will create like an immersive experience of this globally based on these uh, point clouds and data. So what we are on the edge of now is to get better than the big guys. And that will totally turn the thing. There, there, there's not even an argument left for not doing crowdsourced alternatives to big private companies. Just saying that. So you can actually get better than the big ones. So when are you? Very close, yes. Yes. Oh, you saw the data. That's already that's already better. It's just the UI that we need to create uh, to make that appear. So But you must have a very narrow covering in some sense. Or Well ah, here I can actually show you. This is the new version of that presentation that I compiled. So this is not really dense data. Look at this. So someone went around with a Rico Theta, just just these tracks for uh, uh, the biggest railroad company in, uh, in France, and they create their own data from that. So they can just, you know, go around suddenly uh, on these sequences, turn around, and basically cover whatever they need. They will keep the viewing angle, and, you know, they can go there or so. And they will do that for all their stations, and people create their own data. We don't need to be best in the whole world because people are empowered and prepared to create their own data. They will just send people around. For every station, might be 50. Takes them, you know, two weekends to, to, to take the conductor of every train and say, you take 100 pictures. Same for Skona traffic or whatever, and suddenly things just explode, right? There's already data from Helsingborg. Look at this. I mean, uh, Peter, yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, just ask me. Yeah. This is super cool. Uh, any question about crowdsourcing? Crowd yes. Uh, how did you get the ball rolling, though? I mean, that's always the hardest part, right? When you have no photos, yeah. you have no community, how did you engage people? Oh, basically, basically, you go into the niche, 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 geek, nerd communities. So you start very, very narrow. Because that's where people have, have interest. So... So for our case, we actually started by, you know, doing a few sequences here in Westerhamren uh, ourselves, and then uh, we started. Okay, who's who's the most nerdy user of this? And and that's the OpenStreetMap nerds. They go around with you know GPSs on their under their hats and and you know do a lot of interesting stuff. So so I wrote. Uh, I I went into the German OpenStreetMap forums and found out who the top contributors of OpenStreetMap in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern are because we know the Germans are totally nerding for collecting uh, and, and I'm German so, so I wrote 20 of these a personal letter and said you know we are building this new, uh, new service we think that would be interesting for mapping OpenStreetMap and be allowing you to derive data from it so uh, won't you try it uh, and that resulted in a few super nerdy podcast. Oh, there's this guy who mailed me. Do you know about him? Oh, I don't know. And it went into the forums and suddenly, you know, there was 50 contributors coming and they, things spread and then, you know, you got there and there and you keep that going. And at different stages, you do different momentum. I mean, things are not scalable on different levels. But first, the first, say, the first 100 contributors, you can actually hand grow. We started with 150 people uh, just, you know, relatives and friends and so on. Then you grow to, say, 500 people by actually mailing people and, and keeping track of these connections and just, you know, it's like a sales funnel. And then from, say, 1,000, you start to, to do blogs, like content marketing. So, so you get a bit more reach and you, you might get, have some, some, you know, get some Twitter traction and so and then you have to do more stuff. You m might do go. It, it doesn't scale, right? You can you can people drive people to blogs to sign up. 
and then you, you you partner with people. You might get co-featured, or you know we had the uh, we had MIT Tech Review picking this up, or you make some stunts. I mean, there's different steps you can do, but it's like start very 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 close. Grow your first 50 contributors, and you have a sizable amount of evangelists, and tr turn them into evangelists. Give them everything they need. Source code access, whatever they need. Just make them happy. So. Thank you. Cool.